Ecclesiastes chapter 11, starting in verse 7, and we're going to read through 12, verse 8. This will be our second to last time in the book of Ecclesiastes today. Let's pray together. Father, it is good to be together, and it is good to open your word and to read it. And we're thankful to be able to do it together here as your body, the body of Christ. Father, we recognize that every one of us come still struggling with sin in our lives. We also recognize the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us and makes us pure in your sight, not of our own doing, but of the, the perfect sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And so we pray now, Father, um, as sinful people saved by your grace, that uh, as we read your word, Father, you would increase our faith, increase our understanding, and challenge us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, chapter 11, starting verse 7. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, and know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few, and those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low, they are afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags, it, drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Okay, we've been hearing this refrain, all is vanity, throughout this book, our study of the book of Ecclesiastes. And we can look at this word in several ways. Uh, these are the main ways that the preacher here has been using these. When you see the word vanity, we think of vain, we think of worthless, we think of meaningless. And that has been the meaning for a lot of the things he's been talking about. And all of these things apart from God, all the things that he's considering apart from God are worthless, they're vain, they're meaningless. Today in this reading, it's more this word that really captures what he's saying here that these things he's talking about are fleeting. They're here one moment and they're gone the next. And especially he's addressing youth. The days of our youth are fleeting. They pass very quickly. I look at this picture here and I think about just in my own family. You know, I grew up here in Midvale and I think back about the years when I was a teenager and it seems like another lifetime ago. Um, and even though at 51, there are folks in here that still call me a young man, I don't feel like it anymore. But I look at this picture and I look at my own children. My kids go from 24 down to four. And there are several of those stages there that all of my kids are in. And I feel like I'm moving on to those last two guys. I guess I'm close to that second to the last guy there feeling like the cane is coming on, you know? Things are moving along very quickly here. And remember that our teacher here, he's probably feeling all of this, reflecting at the tail end of his life. He's looking back and he said, man, all of the years of my life, they went so quickly. I remember back when I was a young man, full of life and vigor and all of the ambitions that I had. 
and they've all gone so quickly here. Well, he says to us in verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. There's been a lot of grumping <laughs> by Solomon so far here. But here he says, hey, enjoy your youth while you have it. Let that cheer you. Let it bring joy to, to your countenance here because you have it. And he actually, I think he's kind of saying to young people, hey, don't be in too much of a hurry to grow up too quickly here. Okay, you have the rest of your life to deal with all of the responsible things of life, all of the things that you're going to have to do, the obligatory uh, commitments that you're going to have. Enjoy youth while you have it because he has given it to you here. Verse 10, he says, remove vexation from your heart. Put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. In your youth, don't worry too much about worries and trials and aches. Let me tell you, they will be there later. Okay, don't worry about it right now. Remember, it's vanity. Your youth is fleeting. It's going to pass quickly. It'll slip away before you know it. I think about our own culture, and in our culture, we have a category or name for just about every various kinds of age group there is. You know, we've got various things, of, you know, um, millennials and all these various groups, you know, Generation X, Y, on and on it goes. And then you've got teenagers, you've got preteens, you've got tweens, you, you know, there's, we've come up with a name for everything. But really in the Bible, we have youth and we have aged. It's kind of the way it is in the Bible here. And I'm thinking about the way our culture looks at youth. And in our culture, aging people want to stay young. And we want to do things we can to try to keep our youth. You know, Americans spent over $14.6 billion on aesthetic procedures in 2021. These are procedures that did not need to be done. Procedures just to help make us look young. And as I dug through this a little bit, one of the reasons why they spent so much in 2021 was during the pandemic, a lot of people were going on Zoom calls and they saw themselves in Zoom and thought, man, I'm looking old. <laughs> and so they decided they were going to spend money on that and make some changes. Okay, so $14.6 billion uh, in order to stay young with plastic surgery. Americans also spent $9.1 billion on anti-aging creams in 2018, and it's been climbing ever since then. Now, this isn't to call you out if you've had orthodontics or to call you out if you use Noxema or whatever the cream is. That's what my mom used. So I'm probably way behind there. Um, but <laughs> this just captures the fact that we want to stay young. Okay, Our culture worships youth, I think. And so young people often ignore the aged among us too often. Things we do in our society separates our ages, so the young are almost always sequestered away from the aging, which is really a tragedy because the aging are the ones that give us wisdom. How are young people going to know what's important and how to live unless they're able to ask questions and learn from those that have been around the block a little bit here? So uh, often the young people, they're not even around the older people, so they kind of end up ignoring the old. And they'll say things like, you don't understand me. You don't understand the things that I'm going through. And the agent are like, yeah, <laughs> I don't. We never spend any time together, okay? So this is a thing that's going on in our culture. Aging people want to stay young. Young people often ignore the old. And as a culture, we're really missing out on a lot because of that focus. In chapter 12, verse 1, he says, remember also your creator, in the days of your youth. The years are fleeting. And I tell you, when you're younger, younger people think they're invulnerable, impenetrable, immortal. And I told my wife, she asked me last night, are you going to have very many personal stories? I'm just going to tell one today. <laughs> just one. Okay, I know. I couldn't help but I thought about this, how young people just, I mean, how do young people make it through? How did some of us make it through 
our, our younger years, you know, the decisions we made on things. I'm remembering the summer between my junior and senior year when Midville High School, our basketball team, we entered the Fruitland um, Summer Tournament and we were playing all these bigger schools, right? And we won the tournament and we were so excited. And so on our way back down Midvale Hill, we were riding in Robert Wolf's big brown bomber car. And um, there were five of us packed into this car. And I don't know who came up with the idea, but somebody thought, let's see how far we can get just coasting in neutral. So we started at the top of the hill, he put it into neutral. We leaned with the corners which was pretty scary on a few of them there. And we made it all the way into right in front of Slim's Tavern, just coasting the whole way. And at the time we were just like, woohoo, that was awesome. I look back and I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't believe we didn't go off the road and you know, have the uh, local fire department come out and find us upside down. Somehow my parents are gone now, so I can tell that story. How do we make it through in our youth? We think. Nothing's going to touch us. We tend to lean on our own abilities and our own strengths because we don't know any better. But he says, remember, don't lean on your own strengths. Remember your creator. Remember the one that made you, that gave you youth. Because it's passing away quickly. These years are fleeting. Before the evil days come, here an older man, <laughs> remember your creator in your youth. Because the evil days are coming, the years draw near of which you say, I have no pleasure in them. He's like, nothing brings me pleasure anymore. All of that good stuff in the youth is gone. And then he does an interesting thing in verses 3 through 5. He describes his body, uh, the aging life, as a home. Okay? Just look at the things. He says, first of all, you know, the house used to be full of children and servants and life was busy and there were all kinds of things going on. Well, the children have moved out. They've gone away. The servants are gone. We don't need them anymore because there's only the two of us here. And then he describes things. He says, the keepers of the house are weakening. Think about a person's strong arms that are keeping things going around the house here. He says, the strong men that held the house up, they're failing his legs. The grinders cease and are few. This one's a little comical here. What are the grinders? His teeth, okay? They're ceasing, I can't grind anymore. They're few, I'm losing them, okay? We're going backwards here. My kids celebrate when they lose a tooth. It's not the same on the other end of it. The grinders cease and they're few. We have dimmed windows now. His eyesight is failing him. The doors on the street are shut. He can't hear. Sorry, Ryan. He can't hear as well anymore. They're closing up. I rise at the sound of a bird. I can't sleep through the night anymore. The daughters of song are brought low. His voice is beginning to fade. He is afraid of height and obstacles. Falling, breaking a hip. It's real, okay? He's afraid of these things. The almond tree is blossoming. Now this one, you have to think about it a little bit, but what are the color, what are the color of the almond tree blossoms? White, white hair. It's hitting me, right? White hair. The grasshopper is dragging. Now, this is what I wish would happen around my house, actually, out here. The grasshopper is dragging. He's like, there's no life left. I'm having a hard time getting my get up in gear, you know, having a hard time moving here. And then he says, desire fails. All the things that I wanted to do in life, the goals that I had, that bucket list, all of that stuff just seems to be falling away, and I don't quite care as much anymore. And then he says... There's folks out in the street. They're going to mourning. They're going to my funeral. I'm going to my eternal home. He's been describing his own home here, but I'm going to my eternal home here. Literally, he's going to a better place, which is a phrase that you hear often. 
when somebody passes away in our culture today. It's a beautiful poetic way he describes his own life and what's happening. And maybe you can identify with some of these things as you're aging in this life. He also describes life in another way now in verses 6 through 8 here. Remember back to chapter 4, verse 12, when he talks about a threefold cord is not quickly broken? Well, here he says the silver cord is snapped. He says the golden bowl is broken. Silver and gold are precious commodities back then, and they are still today. Those precious commodities that we might have sought out, that we might have put our trust in, um, they're failing, they're broken, they've lost their worth. Then he says, the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, and the wheel is broken at the cistern. Both of these things are dealing with water, and water that's spilling out and spilling away. Water is like a picture of life. It symbolizes life. Life is dripping away. It's falling away. And then he says, the dust returns to the earth. The spirit goes back to God who gave it. We're not just talking about broken things around the house here. He's talking about life, and he's talking about man. And we need to be thinking back to Genesis 1 and 2, where God creates all things. Remember the creator in your youth. God creates all things. And in chapters 1 and 2, there's this beautiful picture of who God is there. And he's, he's pictured in a couple of different ways. Chapter 1 he seems to be transcendent and powerful. He just speaks and things come into being out of nothing. But then in chapter 2, he looks different. Scholars would say it's more of an anthropomorphic view, which is another way to just say he looks more like man. Okay? In chapter 2, he gets down like a gardener and he collects some dirt and he forms man out of the dust of the ground. And then he's like a divine EMT, and he gets down there and performs CPR on Adam, right? And he breathes into Adam the breath of life. Very man-like terms. We can see God is powerful, but also present and working in creating mankind. And so I'm sure that our teacher has this in mind here when he says, remember the creator of your youth, and remember that we're returning to dust. And the spirit, the breath that God gives is returning back to God. And then he has a picture that's important to remember here, that life is brief. It's important to remember these things. Life is brief. It's fleeting. It's passing away quickly. And there will be a time when you'll be, a, you'll be called on by God to account for your life. He says in the latter part of verse 9, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. What things is he talking about? The actions of your life, the things you should have done, but you didn't, the words you spoke, the words you should have spoken, but you didn't, the things that were important to you, the way you spent your money, spent your time, the way you invested in people or didn't, the way you raised your family, all of these things God will bring you into judgment for. And I'm not covering it today, but it comes up again near the end of this book, chapter 12, verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Have you heard the phrase, nothing good happens after midnight? Okay, there's a reason for that. We don't like to broadcast the things that we're doing when we know they're wrong. See, at nighttime, after midnight, when it's dark outside, we feel like we can do the things that we want to hide. Why do we lie? We want to hide the truth. Why is there private or incognito browsing on the internet? Because we want to hide closed and locked doors. We want to hide things from other people. 
God says he will bring every deed into judgment, every secret thing. I couldn't help but think about Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night. But even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Now, the context of that passage in Psalm 139 is a passage of comfort and security. Wherever you roam, God is there with you. And that's a wonderful truth if you're feeling worried or anxious or you're struggling in life. But if you're sinning and trying to hide your sinful behavior... This passage means something else. There's no place that you can hide from him. Everything that you do in life is out in the open to God. You try to hide it, but in secret here, God knows and it will come under his judgment. God is addressing these two age groups, two crowds, and I want to think about it in the context of the church. Yeah, he's... He's looking at youth and he's looking at the aging. And one of the things I love about the church is that this is a place where we naturally rub shoulders together. There aren't a lot of places in life where young and old do things and spend time together and talk about important matters like this. So for young people, he has a few things to say. And so I don't know what group you want to find yourself in here today, but um, See if you can find something in either of these groups to encourage you here. So for youth, he says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember, he's the one that's given you your youth, your energy, uh, and remember him. He is the one that created you. Don't rely on your own strength. Remember, he's the one that's given it to you. Honor your father and mother, young people. And my oldest son told me and encouraged me when we had a conversation earlier in the week that honor your father and mother never has a, um, an end date to it. I was glad to hear that from my 24-year-old. Honor your father and mother. This is given to us in the law. It's Exodus 20, verse 12. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. You also see it in the New Testament as well, in Ephesians and in Colossians. Uh, Paul tells young people to honor their parents. Jesus also mentions it five times in the Gospels as well. So it's an important thing, young people, for you to honor your father and mother. And there's going to be lots of times you think like, I don't know why the old man is after me here. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. But because God told me to, I'm going to go ahead and honor my dad today. I'm going to honor my mom today. Uh, I will remember God is the one that created me and he asked me to honor my parents, the ones that he's put over me and in charge of my life. I need to trust them today. So young people, when you run into difficult times, young people tend to look for counsel, but they don't look to people that have the answers. Young people tend to look to other young people for their answers. They'll look to peers, right? You understand me. You get me, right? We're going through this. That guy's crazy, right? Yeah, sure, he's crazy. Okay? But that's not wisdom. Young people don't have the wisdom of years. Young people, sure, talk to your peers, your own age group, about the struggles you have. But don't ignore the ones that have wisdom around you. Look to them for the answers. God has given it to them, and he'll share it with you. So honor your father and mother. These are the two that God has put right in your life to share. Young people have a curiosity given to them by God, an energy to do things, an energy that every wise older person wishes they had, but don't anymore. And they say things like, oh man, youth is wasted on all the wrong people. It's a wonderful life if you know that movie. Okay, but... Um, Young people have an energy and a curiosity for things. This is the time to explore the world and see what God has made, to marvel at it, 
to look at all of the things that he's created and see all of that point you towards him. Go explore a little bit. Take some trips with some wise people. Go and see some things. This is a moment maybe to think about being a missionary, to serve in any part of the world. God might be sending you out there. But take that curiosity, that energy that God has given you and do something good with it. Look to serve. Look to use it in ministry that he might put you into. Okay? Um, use your curiosity and energy and point it towards the Lord. I'll also say for the young people today that our young people tend to be more and more biblically illiterate. They don't know the word of God anymore. Because our culture doesn't know the word of God anymore. It's not a common thing that's talked about in our society today. And one of the things leading toward this is young people tend to read less and less these days. We're a visual culture. I understand that. I've got words up here on the screen today for you to see. We are a visual culture. But we need to remember here, if we're reading less, young people, that means that you're going to be reading God's word less. And you're going to find out less about God and his son Jesus that he revealed through the written word. So I want to encourage you young people, don't keep going with this, this standard that's developing here. Don't just go to YouTube to learn about God. Read his word. Spend some time in his word. Aging people, remember this verse. Know that God will bring you into judgment. As we move closer towards the end of our life, I think we, we think about that a little bit more here. Remember that and, and have, let that sharpen your view as you look back at life and sharpen how you spend your time here and now. And I'd just like to urge you, don't give up reading. Maybe your eyesight is failing. It becomes a drudgery. Or maybe you feel like, you know, I've read this passage a thousand times. Maybe I already know this here. Find new ways to read God's word, to keep it interesting, to keep it fresh for you here. Read different kinds of translations that might give you different perspectives on things. Use some reading plans and use a different reading plan each year to keep that fresh for you here. And maybe if your eyesight has failed so much that you just can't read it anymore, listen to God's word. Find a good translation with an audio version of it. You can stream it on the internet. You can, I can, you can still find CDs. And if you have a cassette player, you can probably rummage around and find that somewhere on eBay. I don't know. But um, if you have an eight track, I doubt that the Bible's on that. I don't know. Um, but listen to God's word. And that's actually the way all of this was first given to people is they heard it. When a letter was written, it was read out loud to the church. That's the way they heard it. So listen to God's word and let that challenge you. I want to encourage you aging people to intentionally love and mentor our young that are around us. There should be no chasm, no gaping chasm between the young and the old. This is God's way. That's why he calls it the body of Christ, the family of God, his people. He urges that old men teach young men. Proverbs 27, 17 is iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Titus 2, 2, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. And then verse 6, Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. How are they going to learn to be self-controlled? By seeing the older men being self-controlled as well and teaching them. Older women, teach young women. Titus 2, 3, and 4. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to too much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and their children. It happens in words and it happens in your actions and the way you live your life. Live in such a way that we see that lived out in our younger people as they're looking to you here. This is going to take intentional effort. And it can happen through simple ways like older people just greeting the young people. 
like Eric and Ryan calling my six-year-old daughter Stitch, okay? Because she fell off her bicycle and has two stitches up here. And she, she laughs about it, okay? She likes it. These two guys of two different age groups here um, are connecting with my, my little daughter here and giving her a nickname. By the way, Jesus gave nicknames to his disciples. It's a term of endearment, right? Okay, so I love that kind of thing. It's their intentional way to connect with my daughter. And all of us can do that. Younger people, ask questions of the older ones. See how they're doing. Older people, ask questions of the younger ones. Talk with them. Let's get to know each other here. Um, you know, as we're going back into the school year now here, um, we took off the summer from youth group because things got so busy and it was so difficult. And I had a question today, when's youth group gonna start up again? Um, we need to be talking about that. And I'd like to encourage you, would you take a Wednesday a month or just whatever one day of the week youth group ends up being and saying, you know, I'm going to intentionally just take one uh, day there in the month and I'm going to come and I'm going to speak to some teenagers. I'm going to show them that I care and I'm going to teach them from the Bible and my own life. Just personally invest in them a little bit. You can come up with a hundred different ways. Our Bible class, Patrice and some of our moms spending time with the children teaching this. This is an intentional way to pass on the faith. And it's God's way here. But we need to be intentional about it because it's not natural. It doesn't feel natural to us to talk with somebody that doesn't get us. So we avoid each other. It ought not to be that way. Take to heart our teacher's words today. Life is fleeting. And one day, we don't know when, but the time is coming sooner every day, we'll stand before the Lord and give an accounting for our lives. So I want to say to you, first of all, you need to make sure that Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, is your Lord and Savior. If he isn't, you need to make that commitment today. Young people, old people, whatever, wherever you find yourself in life, if he isn't Lord of your life, you need to make that happen today because you're not guaranteed this afternoon. And secondly, since life and time are fleeting, you need to make the most of the time that you have. We're told that in the Bible. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of of the time. And Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Time is probably our most precious commodity. What are you doing with the time that God has given you? Time is fleeting. It's passing quickly. You're moving every minute towards meeting your creator and maker. What are you doing with the time? Are you mentoring young people who are looking to you, whether they know it or not, about what's important in life? Make the best use of the time. Is Jesus your Lord? Make him your Lord today if he's not. Let's stand and sing our invitation song. Let's pray. Kevin's trying to point out how directionally challenged a bunch of us are on that song. <laughs> um, this morning I wanted to read a section of scripture out of Numbers. And uh, I'll make the connection when I'm done reading here. So uh, Numbers 22, starting at verse 21. So Balaam arose in the morning and saddled his donkey and went with the leaders of Moab. But God was angry because he was going, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, the donkey turned off from the way and went into the field. But Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path of the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed herself to the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck her again. 
And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn to the right hand or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam was angry and struck the donkey with his stick. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And then Balaam said to the donkey, It's not what I would have said. <laughs> because you have made mockery of me, if there had been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. I would have been like, donkeys talk? <laughs> but apparently this is just common, so not really. God's obviously involved here. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life to this day? Have, you, have I ever been accustomed to do so to you? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and he bowed all the way to the ground. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out as an adversary, because your way was contrary to me. But the donkey saw me and turned aside from these three turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I would surely have killed you just now and let her live. And Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now then, if it is displeasing to you, I will turn back. But the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but you shall speak only the word which I shall tell you. So Balaam went along with the leaders of Balak. So, um, this is kind of an odd scripture maybe to use at the table, um, but, but in 1 Corinthians, uh, we're told as we come to the table um, that we are to examine ourselves, and um, I'll just read that. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which is a, a scripture often read during this time. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you were weak and sick, and a number asleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. So we see in the story of Balaam and his donkey, um... Balaam didn't see the obvious angel of the Lord, and it, and it took his donkey to save him. His donkey telling him, hey, you know, you're, you're missing something here. And so as we come to the table today, um, we come here, we want to come here in a right mind, and we want to come here examining ourselves. Um, and so we need to look, and we need to listen to our donkey, right? When we, when we come here, not, not just today, but what, what is that thing that you're missing? What is that angel of the Lord about ready to strike you down that you're not seeing? And who's that donkey or what is that donkey trying to tell you, hey, I'm the Lord, I'm about to do something here. Um, you know, we're here this morning at this time because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we're to come here in a, in a right manner. What, is, what are those things that, that Jesus is telling us? Hey, you need to examine this in your life and you need to take some action. And so as we come to the table this morning, in the silence as the emblems are being passed, um, let's come in a right manner and let's examine ourselves. Let's identify those things that are so obvious we're missing them. What are those things? Jesus did this great thing for us by giving his body, uh, the, represented by the bread, and giving his blood for us. And so... We could never be worthy of this, but we can come in a worthy manner, and we can look and find those things in our lives that need to be addressed and admitted. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you this morning. Uh, we bow our hearts in humility and without procrastination, Lord. Uh, we come looking for those things. Uh, we want to we wanna put ourselves in the right light and not just to lower ourselves uh, but to realize that we need you and we aren't perfect and we have issues in our lives and so we come this morning and we want to think of those things and bring those things to our mind 
and, and confess those to you and just be right with you as we take this communion in remembrance of the great thing that uh, you have done for us through Jesus and Jesus' sacrifice. So we thank you for this bread uh, representing Jesus' body, and may we take it in a worthy manner. We love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we now come to the cup and we uh, take, we want to take to heart uh, what, what Jesus' blood meant to us and what it means to us and uh, the sacrifice that was provided and the blood that covers our sins. Uh, we're thankful for that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so as we come to this time of the offering, I'm reminded of um, when Jesus is sitting in the temple with his disciples and they see the woman with so little um, put in a very, a very little bit of money and Jesus makes a point um, that she is given out of her poverty and a lot of people are giving out of their wealth. And I think it highlights to us that, you know, Jesus doesn't really need or God doesn't really need our money. It's all his. Um, but what he's interested in is our, our, our person and, and how we approach giving and our heart. And so um, as we reflect on giving today and every day, uh, we should always just be um, cognizant of that relationship with, with God and um, that we should have that, that spirit of generosity on our heart. And what that looks like to each of us is different. So. Um, but Jesus appreciates it when we give cheerfully, and um, he can do a lot with very little. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that uh, you'll bless what's given this morning. Uh, may, it, may it be 100% for your work, and uh, just pray that our hearts will be right as we approach giving and as we approach uh, generosity. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity. Uh, to return what you have given to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.